Shalom. My name is Yeshaya Ben Dan Ben Yisrael. This time we're going to go over some stuff in reference with Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter. Controversial issue because some want to state that Deuteronomy 28 from verse 52 to verse 68 is talking about the Romans attacking the children of Israel and nothing else. However, when you read Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, we know good and well that's not the case. What we're going to focus on in this presentation here is the 68th verse of Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter. And here's what it says in the English. And the Lord shall bring thee back into Egypt again with ships by the way whereof I spoke unto thee. Thou shalt see it no more again. And there you shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. Now, many Israelites know and understand that this is speaking about the children of Israel after they were scattered within the continent of Africa, namely West Africa, being shipped over to the Western Hemisphere in slave ships. In order to understand this, let's understand even English grammar. English grammar in this first part here, in verse 68, starts off with the word and. It's a conjunction. It shows that's attached to the words before it. So now if we were to go into verse 67, here's what it says. In the morning you shall say, we're God and we're even. And at even you shall say, we're God and we're morning. For the fear of thine heart, wherewith thou shalt fear. And for the sight of thine eyes, which thou shalt see. Let's go into verse 66. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee. And thou shalt fear day and night. And shall have no assurance of your life. Let's go to verse 65. And among these nations thou shalt find no ease. Neither shall the soul of your foot have rest. But the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart. And feeling of eyes and sorrow of mind. Let's go into verse 64. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people. From the one end of the earth even unto the other. And there you shall serve other gods. Which neither thou nor thy fathers have known. Even wood and stone. One of the things to be pointed out brothers and sisters. Is Deuteronomy 28 verse 68. Because it gives you an understanding of how the people were to go into captivity. Now one of the things to be known and understood is the mindset of what Egypt was to the ancient Israelites. Let's go, if we will, into the book of Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. Exodus chapter 20, verse 1, and it reads on this wise. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So, when you also go into the book of 1 Kings chapter 8, when you read about the prayer of Solomon, he also described Egypt as the iron furnace, even the house of bondage. So now the Israelite mindset when they were speaking about Egypt, certainly when it speaks about Egypt and the curses of Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, they're talking about a bondage. They're not talking about the literal land of Egypt itself. Some people state that it's talking about when Titus brought Israelites over from the land of Israel into Egypt but that's not what it's talking about because this is why we have to understand reading comprehension because that's why I went back all the way into verse 64 and it says and the Lord shall scatter thee among all people so we understand that the issue of Israel being sent into Egypt again by ships is after the scattering happened and after verse 65 and among these nations, meaning that after Israel was scattered from one end of the earth to the other, and among these nations you shall find no ease, neither shall the soul of your foot have rest. But the Most High shall give thee there a trembling heart and filling eyes and sorrow of mind. When in history, if some people try to state that Deuteronomy 28 from verse 62 to verse 68 is talking about the Romans in Israel, when did that happen in history in verse 65? When did the Romans scatter Israel from one end of the earth to the other? Right? Okay, getting back into verse 68. And the Lord shall get... Pardon. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships. 
by the way whereof I spoke unto thee. Thou shalt see it no more again. And there you shall be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. Now, if we read Deuteronomy the 28th chapter in the Hebrew, verse 68, here is what we read, brothers and sisters. It says this. Where his sheep caught, yod he wa he mitzrayim, ba aniyot, ba derek, ashir amortilaka, lo tosif od lir ota, where hit makaratim sham, lo oibeka, la abadim, wa lish pakot, wa ain krone. Now I know good and well that there are some Israelites who view Hebrew with vowels as being different than the ancient. That's not what the subject matter of this presentation is about. However, going over this portion right here, it says, Wehesheb Ka. Now, the Wa, which is the first letter that you see there, that means and. Hesheb Ka. The Ka sound at the end means you. Hesheb means to bring back or to return. It's the he filled verb stem or the fifth verb form of the word shab which means to return where has sheep ka the most high will return yah the most high mitzrayim the most high will return you egypt by aniyot in ships now let's go over this word mitzrayim or egypt to understand the mindset of the ancient israelites first off ancient egypt itself did not call its own self mitzrayim Mizraim or Mizraim is the name that ancient Israel called that particular place. The ancient Egyptians had a name for their own selves. Just the same, the ancient Egyptians did not call themselves Egyptians. That's a Greek word given to them. Just like the word Mizraim is a Hebrew word by the Israelites given to the Egyptians. Just like the word Israel is the Egyptian word of how they said Israel and the Meneptestela. Just like they said Kor and the Meneptestela is the people of Aram. And the people of Aram were called Syrians by the people who were called Greeks. And the Greeks were called the Hellenes by their own selves, but were called the people of Yawan by the Israelites. So in order to understand certain things, you got to understand that certain people had names for their own selves. And certain people called other people certain names. So getting back into this portion here. Deuteronomy 28 verse 68 going over the word Mizraim. The word is spelled as Mem Zade Resh Yod Mem. Now, if you were to break that word down, the Hebrew word in the beginning with Mitzrayim is a Mem. That means from or of. All right? And then the next two letters is a Zade and a Resh. Zade and Resh spell Zar by itself. The word Zar means distress, it means affliction, it means trouble, it means burdensome. Alright? So if you were to just remove the Mem, which is not against the rules in Hebrew, you would have the word Zarayim. In Hebrew, anytime you have a double plural, you have what they call the Ayim. For instance, Gerabayim means socks. That's pluralized by two. Enayim means eyes. That's pluralized by two. You have two eyes. Yadayim means hands. You have two hands. Aznayim means ears. You have two ears. So when you hear Hebrew pluralizations and it ends with an ayim sound, what is being presented is whatever the word is talking about is doubled. So Mitzrayim or Matzir Yam means double trouble double affliction double distress now another way you can break that down is if you were to say Mitch Ryan by saying Mazar Yam which means the distress or the border and Yam means sea so we can take the understanding of how ancient Israel thought of Mitch Ryan as such and that's not a bad thing to do because, as stated, the ancient Egyptians did not call themselves Mizraim. That's a name the Israelites applied to them. So you're not going to really find, like, per se, the word Mizraim written in Egyptian records because that's an Israelite term for Egypt because of what they was experiencing and what they was going through at that particular time. All right? So now, let's go, if we will, into this verse here again. 
Deuteronomy 28, verse 68. And it says, Where has sheep kaya mitraim? Ba aniyot. The Hebrew word aniyot means ships. Ba means in the or with the. Aniyot means ships, plural, from the Hebrew word aniyah, which means ship. Ba derek, by the way or by the path. Ashir, which W H I C H. Amorati laka, I have said unto you. Lo tosif o lir ota. Now that's very important too to understand the Hebrew phrase there, lo tosif. The Hebrew word lo means no or not. Tosif, it comes from the Hefil verb stem hasif, which means to add on or to increase or to multiply, right? Lo tosif od lir ota. Od means again. Lir ota, where you see the finger is there in the video. That hey, which is the last letter of that word, signifies that it's of the feminine. The captivity, the land, the captivity, the oppression, what the people were going to go into, anything in Hebrew that you go into is represented in the feminine. All right? Lir Ota, which I have said unto thee, it shall not be added unto thee to see it. That's a better and proper translation of that verse. Because... What Moshe or Moses was speaking about in Deuteronomy 28 verse 68 is speaking in reference about seeing it, being in it. And what is it? It is the captivity. It is not talking about the literal land of Egypt itself. That's not what it's talking about, brothers and sisters. Because when Israelites later on in history, after the era of Solomon, went to Egypt on their own volition, they wasn't going into captivity. So obviously when ancient Israel said Mizraim, they knew what they were talking about. Just the same. Black people know what black people were talking about in the 1940s and 50s. When they sang that song, don't want to go to Mississippi no more. There's a man by the door. If he grabs you by the collar, you better holler. I don't want to go to Mississippi no more. That's talking about the lynchings when they used to hang black people by nooses on trees. Now, here we have some Europeans who are not the people who were enslaved in Egypt. Here you have some Europeans who are not the people who were with the Prophet Moshe. And you have some Europeans who are not the ones in the bottom of the slave ships attempting to explain what Deuteronomy 2868 is talking about. That's as intelligent as they trying to explain the blues that black people sang. It's not your place. You did not experience that captivity. You do not know the soul and the anguish that the people was coming from in this situation. So now, getting back into this verse here. Lo tosif od lir ota. Wahit makar tem. Another interesting point. Because in the average English standard, it says, And you shall be sold unto your enemies. But makar means to sell. But hit makar means to sell yourself. Which means that the people will go back into captivity and ships. By a way in which they were not supposed to see the captivity again. And they will devote themselves or sell themselves there. La oibeka to your enemies. La abadin walish fakot. For male servants and for female servants. Wa ain kwone. Now anybody very familiar with Hebrew know that a maid servant is the word ama in Hebrew. The Hebrew word shifka means a female servant. We're not talking about a maid servant. We're talking about somebody like the Harriet Tubman thing in which you went through chattel slavery. That's what happened with us. We devoted ourselves in the land of our captivities and it says wa'en kwone. There's no buyer. There's no purchaser. There's no redeemer. That's what Deuteronomy 28 verse 68 is talking about. Now for those who might disagree with the presentation that's being presented, let's go back into the English Standard Bible and let's go into Deuteronomy 28 verse 15 and go over some things to let it be known so that way I can attempt, most I willing, to strengthen my point. Okay, Deuteronomy 28 15. But it shall come to pass, if you are not hearken unto the voice of Yah your power, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. So that right there shows you it's not a time set 
in which this had to have been. So to try to sit there and say from a certain verse that it was talking about the Romans and the Israelites, you're incorrect, right? Cursed shalt thou be in the city, and cursed shalt thou be in the field. Deuteronomy 28's curses began to happen while Israel was still in the land. If you don't believe it, go to Daniel chapter 9, verse 11. And it shows you that. Right? Now, let's go, if we will, to Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter. We're going to start in verse 45. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee. It shall pursue thee and overtake thee till thou be destroyed because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the most high your power to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee and they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder and upon thy seed forever. Now when it says forever it means an undetermined length of time because the Hebrew word let olam the root of olam comes from elam which means to be hidden. Or to disappear. So it's not saying that it shall be forever as if eternity. It's saying that forever like an undetermined length of time. Just the same. When people speak even though we're not promised to live forever. People say oh I was doing this forever. They know what people are talking about when the statement is said. Remember Deuteronomy 28 was said by a man. Moses to the Israelites. Okay. So now let's go on. Because you did not serve the most high thy God. With joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which Yah shall send against thee, and hunger, and in thirst, and in nakedness, and in want of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he hath destroyed thee. Brothers and sisters, I want to go um into the Hebrew of that. Deuteronomy the twenty eighth chapter, verse forty five. In the Hebrew, here's what we read. Ubau aleka kol hak la lo ha ele Urdafuka wehisiguka ad hish shamdak Kilo shamata bo kol ya eloheka Lishmor mit wotai wa ku kotai a shel ziwak Wahayu bak lo ot ul mo pit Ub zar aka ad olam Takat a shel lo abata et ya eloheka Ba simka ub tub le bab me rob kol wa abata et oibeka a show ye shall kenu ya beka beraab ub zama ub erom ub koser kol when I turn old barza al zawareka ad hish me do otak. So, right here, let's just go over in verse 48 in the Hebrew. There's a reason why. Right in verse 48, it says this Wa abata et oibeka, and you shall serve thine enemies, which the Most High shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness. And that's exactly how we came over here, brothers and sisters. Um, I have this book here, right? Many people heard about this book here. Pardon if the light's a little off. It's called Roots, right, by Alex Haley. Now, in this book here, when you go into the 34th chapter of this book here, right, here's something that we read. Kulta wondered if he had gone mad, naked, chained, shackled, he awoke on his back between two other men in a pitch darkness full of steamy heat and sickening stink in a nightmarish bedlam of shrieking, weeping, praying, and vomiting. He could feel and smell his own vomit in his chest and belly. His whole body was one spasm of pain from the beatings he had received in the four days since his capture. But the place where the hot iron had been put between his shoulders hurt the worst. In the same chapter of here, it says this. Kunta was let alone rest of the night. At dawn, he began to make out, tied to two other bamboo trunks, 
The figures of the other captured people, 11 of them, six men, three girls, and two children, all guarded closely by armed slate teeth in Tubab. Tubab means white and or Caucasian, if I'm not mistaken, in Mandinga. The girls were naked. Kuta could only avert his eyes. He had never seen a naked woman before. The men, also naked, sat with murderous hatred etched in their faces, grimly silent and crusted with blood from whip cuts. But the girls were crying out, one about dead loved ones in a burned village, another bitterly weeping, rocked back and forth, curling endurance in an imaginary infant in her cradled arms and a third shrieking at intervals that she was going to see Allah. Now let me explain. The reason why they would say Allah is because by the time the Israelites was brought over here, they had already been indoctrinated with Islam, which is another subject for another situation. We are speaking about Deuteronomy 28, verse 68, and what happened with the children of Israel over here. It says emphatically that the men were naked, he was naked, and the girls were naked. And in verse 40. Eight, it says, Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the most high shall sin against thee, and hunger, and in thirst, and in nakedness, and the one of all things. Now, in the one of all things is because you lack things. That's why you want it. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he hath destroyed thee. Now, when you look into slavery books and books on slavery, or even Google images of slavery, you will see the yoke of iron and nakedness and so forth and so on. So, now... Verse 68, remember the conjunction of the word and, because it says leka, heshibka, and any time, in most cases, that is, when you read in Deuteronomy 28, the word ka at the end of the word in Hebrew, it shows you that it's talking about you or your. All right? Now, Deuteronomy 28, 68 says, in the English again, and the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships, by the way whereof I spoke unto thee, Thou shalt see it no more again. Now, as we was going over, we went over the word Mizraim. We understood that it is Matzorayim, which means the distress of the sea or double oppression. Because the Hebrew word Matzor means oppression. Right? Now, let's prove that biblically in the Hebrew. If we go into Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, verse... 53 Deuteronomy 28 verse 53 in the English we see this and thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body the flesh of thy sons and of thy daughters which Yah thy power have given thee in the siege and in the straightness wherein thine enemy shall distress thee Now, in verse 53 in the Hebrew of Deuteronomy 28, here is what we read. Wa'akalta peribitneka basarbaneka ubnoteka ashonatan laka ya eloheka bamatzor ubmatzok asho yatzik laka now, one of the things we keep on running over, if you're following in the Hebrew, is the word oibeka. Oibeka means your enemy or your enemies. It comes from the Hebrew word oyeb, which means to be at odds. It means to be at anger. It also means enmity. You see, so that's what it's talking about. These are not your friends who brought you over here. All right? So... The Hebrew word also in Deuteronomy 28, verse 53, we also see the Hebrew word Matzor, and that means distress. It's used right there in the same chapter, and all that difference between the Hebrew word Matzor and Mizraim is a Yod and a Mem at the end of the word. Okay, now let's go over the writing, so that way people can see what I'm attempting to speak about. Now, what I'm going to do now in this presentation here with this paper and pen is spell these words out so people can see what's being spoken about. This here would be a mem. Now, we're dealing with the uh, modern Hebrew script, all right, for understanding purposes. This here will be a zade, right? 
This is a Resh, a Yod, and a Mem. So this word right here spells Mids Rayim. Right? Because Hebrew is read from right to left. We got meats. Meets Ryan. Okay, now with this, let's understand this. If you were to just take these right here, right, you would get this word here, which is the Hebrew word Zal. Zal means trouble, right? Um, it's used in several parts. Good point. Um, when you go to Leviticus 18, the Hebrew word Zarar is used, and it means to be at odds um, or to vex. Okay, and um, it says a man should not marry a woman and her sister to be a rival to her. Well, the Hebrew word that's used there in that root for rival or contention or problems, if you may, is the Hebrew word zar in its root, right? So therefore, now Deuteronomy 28 verse 53, as we read, we saw this word here. Ma zor, which means distress. So here we got trouble, and here we got distress. So ayin is the double pluralization of something. Now, I know my penmanship may not be 100% quote-unquote neat, but um, the meaning is still understandable. If not, please um, leave me a message in the um, post, and um, I will attempt to explain further. Deuteronomy 28, 68 is not talking about the Romans and the Israelites. It is talking about what happened after the children of Israel were scattered to some of the Israelites that were scattered, that were shipped over here to the Western Hemisphere. Okay, let's understand that. Now, I'd like to read an article about this matter. Let's go on. This is presented to you due to the fact that who say that the Atlantic slave trade was not prophesied by the prophet Moshe or Moses. Some say that Deuteronomy 28 verse 68 is speaking about the Romans bringing the Israelites over to the literal land of Egypt. Well, the Israelites know better than that. Egypt is noted in the Bible as the house of bondage. Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5, and Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 20, and in the book of 1 Kings chapter 8 verse 51. Egypt is mentioned three times in Deuteronomy 28. Verse 27, verse 60, and verse 68. Each time Egypt is depicted as bad. To the ancient Israelites, Egypt was not a good place. Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 8, and Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 15. So in order to understand the Israelite mindset, it, it behooves one to read why the Israelites would say such a thing. All right? I have a book here entitled Egypt, Canaan, and Israel in ancient times. Now I'm going to read just a part of it. Because it's not really about. What happened so much with ancient Israel. And ancient Egypt. Per se. It's more so about what happened with us over here. Uh, by the way the slave trade started before 1619. The infamous 1619 date. Is when the British got involved in it. But you had black people that were shipped over from. Western Africa. Coming over here to the. Um, Western hemisphere by the Spanish. In South Carolina in 1526. And even before that, you had it to where black people were shipped over because the first slave ship left from Spain. There were black people that were living in Spain. Um, and they were captured and shipped over to Brazil by the Portuguese. Okay, so now, um, this here says, in page 101, the Brooklyn Museum Papyrus. Another brief notice is, Passed in review in the last chapter, meaning the last chapter of this book, demonstrate clearly the presence in Egypt during the 12th and 13th dynasties of a sizable Asiatic population of servile status, presumably brought back as a result of foreign wars. Now, I wanted to read just that part right there because it shows you that the Brooklyn Papyrus, and that's really the Brooklyn Papyrus 35.1446. It actually speaks about people who were Asiatic, and that is to say have Hebrew names, who were part of the Kimnu, or the servants or slaves that was in Egypt. 
Okay, so let that be understood. Now, many brothers who are into the comedic science try to say, well, they can't deny the Brooklyn Papyrus because that's an Egyptian record itself. So what they try to state is, um, well, they were brought back there as um, war captives. That means that's a problem. That's not good. People try to make it sound and butter it up like, well, those are just war prisoners. They're still captive. I'd rather ask the servant how he or she thinks as opposed to the enslaver. Okay? Now, let's go on in this article here. In the Bible, there are examples of nations depicted as animals. Daniel chapter 7 verse 5. The issue at hand is in reference to Deuteronomy 28 verse 68 in the mention of Egypt. First, the word Egypt is an English word whose root goes back to the Greek word Egyptos. The ancient Egyptians called their lands Tomeri and Tamehu. The ancient Egyptians viewed their land in respect of the flow of the Nile River. The Nile River flowed from south to north. Thus they were called, thus they called Southern Egypt, Upper Egypt, and Northern, Northern Egypt, Lower Egypt. When historically the Pharaoh Amos defeated the Hyksos, he placed the red and white crown on his head, signifying the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt. This was called Tsimatawi. Sima in Egyptian meaning unity and Tawi meaning two lands. The ancient Israelites knew this too about Egypt being a dual land. The Hebrew word Mitzrayim is translated meaning Egypt, but the literal meaning is double distress or double siege. Because the Israelites were in distress while they was in that particular land. So let that be understood. They describe the land according to their situation at hand. An example of that is when Joseph sired his children Ephraim and Menashe. When he, he gave, when he sired Menashe, Menashe means one who causes to forget. And that's what he wanted to forget about certain things that happened in his father's house. And then when he had Ephraim, he said the Most High made him a double fruitful in the land of his affliction. So even when you read about people naming their names to their children, it was for the situations going on at that time. So when the Israelites called the land Mizraim, it was because of what was going on with them at that time. As a sidebar for those who are familiar with the ancient Egyptian writing referred to as Metuneta, we know that Kor is Aram on the Merneptah Stella, and that was already stated from before. For those with, the, with an issue and know of the issue with Ahab, king of Israel, and Shamanassar the third, the king of Assyria, we know that Ahabu Israela is Ahab the Israelite. So we know good and well that the Israelites were mentioned in the writings of other people. All right. The Hebrew word Montzor can be found in Deuteronomy 28 verse 55, verse 57, Job chapter 20 verse 22, and 2 Samuel chapter 24 verse 14. And it means sorrow or distress. To show that Deuteronomy 28.68 is not speaking of Egypt itself, only lets one understand that the ancient nations traveled from Canaan to Egypt periodically. The traders during the 12th dynasty of Egypt, as well as the Hyksos, the Hebrews, and the Egyptians themselves went back and forth. Amos and Thutmose traveled to Canaan, and there was no ship needed. They were pharaohs in Egypt. The leader Rehoboam of Israel and the prophet Uriah during the time of Jeremiah traveled to Egypt. There was no ship needed. Isaiah chapter 19 verse 18 and Hosea chapter 8 verse 13 speaks of Israelites being in Egypt. There was no ship needed for such. Jeremiah 44 speaks of Israelites in Egypt. They didn't go there by ship. Deuteronomy 28 verse 68 says, By the way whereof I said unto thee, thou shalt see it no more. That's talking about they were never supposed to see the captivity anymore. The double straits, the distress, that is what they were not supposed to see anymore. All right. So now let us go on in this article here. I wanted to read some excerpts from it. Right. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 45 again 
Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee and overtake thee, till thou be destroyed, because you did not hearken unto the voice of the Most High your God, to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee. And they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder, and upon thy seed forever. So we see that we cannot just say that the curses of Deuteronomy 28 is only talking about a one particular set time. Deuteronomy 28, let's start in verse 17. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Most High shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, and rebuke, and all that you set your hand unto to do, until thou be destroyed, and until thou perish quickly, because of the wickedness of your doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me. The above mentioned curses and the others that were mentioned in the same chapter is known to the Israelites to come upon them and overtake them. And who fits that? There is a particular individual who made a video trying to state that Deuteronomy 28 is talking about from verse 52 concerning the Romans and the Israelites. The curses from Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 48 to 68 is not talking about the Romans and the Israelites. It is talking about the Israelites in reference with the other nations. There is a couple of problems with trying to state that that portion is only talking about Israel and the Romans. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 21 says, And the pestilence shall cleave unto thee until you are consumed from off the land whether you go to possess it. So, if we remember that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee, so it's talking about a continuous thing. It's not just one particular just set time. So from Deuteronomy 28 verse 45, the curses before that and the curses after verse 46, all of that was going to happen to the nation of Israel or the nation of Israel. All right, now. Deuteronomy 28 Let's go in this article here, that is. I'm not going to read the whole article. I just um, wanted to read excerpts from it. Now, those who are familiar with Israelite history know that the Israelites had problems with nations and being driven from one from their land before and after the Roman situation. Pompeii in 63 BC made Jerusalem a Roman province. Now, let's look at 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 11. And he settled his countenance steadfastly until he was ashamed and the man of God wept. And Hazael said, Why weepeth my Lord? And he answered, Because I know the evil that thou wilt do unto the children of Israel. Their strongholds wilt thou set on fire, and their young men wilt thou slay with the sword, and will dash their children and rip their women with child. And Hazael said, But what? Is thy servant a dog that he should do this great thing? And Elisha answered, The Most High have showed me that thou shalt be king over Syria. So he departed from Elisha and came to his master and who said to him, Who said Elisha to thee? What said Elisha to thee? Pardon. And he answered, He told me that thou shouldest surely recover. If we go into the book of 2 Kings chapter 10 verse 32. In those days the Most High began to cut Israel short. And Hazael smote them in the coast of Israel. From Jordan eastward. All the land of gal A, The Gadites and the Reubenites and the Manassites. From Eroer. Which is by the river Arnon. Even gal Aid and Bashan. So that's part of what was going on in the land of Israel. With Deuteronomy 28 coming into effect. Are we going to say that Deuteronomy 28 and the curses that came upon and overtook the Israelites was started with the Romans? The word siege means the operation of reducing and capturing a fortified place by surrounding it, cutting off supplies, undermining, bringing guns to bear, bombing, and other offensive operation, operations. Siege implies surrounding and cutting off communications and usually includes direct assaults on its defenses. Siege equals besiege. Siege mentioned happening to the Israelites before the time of the Romans. 
Let's look at on your own time. Second Chronicles chapter 32 verse 10, Ezekiel chapter 4 verse 3, Second Kings chapter 17 verse 5, Second Kings chapter 24 verse 11, Second Kings chapter 25 verse 2, and Jeremiah chapter 39 verse 1. All of those places mentioned there speaks about the Israelites being besieged or going under siege. But they want to sit there and tell us that the besiegement happened with the Romans. Deuteronomy 28 started in the land and it continued all the way to we came over here in the western hemisphere by ships. Shalom.